Kilo Sierra, departing 3 1, South Departure Falcon. Hey everybody, Brian here from E3 Aviation, and I'm here with John Waters, call sign Ring, and we're here with Mark from Cub Crafters, and uh, we're here at Oshkosh 2022. It's been a beautiful event. Shout out to all the Oshkosh group for doing such a great event. Also, shout out to one of our partners, Banyan Air Service, who helps us make all this stuff happen. But we're very fortunate today to uh, going to be walking through the history of Cub Crafters with Mark and. He's from the factory, and we appreciate you being here, Mark. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks so for having we're, us. We're going to walk through these cub crafters that we have here, or, you know, or our carving cubs that we have here, and um, just take you through the whole thing. And then we're going to get out, and we're going to fly with Steve-O and with John. We're going to get in. You probably all know that uh, E3 Aviation, we have some airplanes in the company. So one of them happens to be a carbon cub, an FX3, just like this one. And we have an absolute blast in that plane, and that's the one we're going to be flying with John and Steve-O here. And uh, Mark's going to kind of walk us through this. He's going to be talking to John. We're going to get John in the cockpit and uh, just take you through these airplanes. And they're awesome. Good. Mark, can you tell us about you know, just the history of Carbon Cub and what got us to where we are today? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, Cub Crafters is a 42-year-old company started by our founder, Jim Richmond. Um, Jim uh, had been a uh, person that was interested in backcountry flying, spent a lot of time in Alaska, did a lot of mission work all over the world and he was looking for a way to develop airplanes that uh, were based on the uh, Super Cub, an airplane that was uh, mission capable for just about anything. We wanted to make the airplane bigger, lighter, stronger, uh, faster, more capable in the backcountry. Um, today we have seven different models in our product line and it's just a tremendous airplane for people to use. Awesome, awesome. So what's the current lineup now? What do we have here? So. Uh, at Cub Crafters today, we have the Carbon Cub SS, uh, a light sport airplane. You can buy that airplane as a straight up LSA airplane or an ELSA airplane. Uh, if you want something that's a little more uh, user friendly as far as gross weight, we get into our FX line, which is our builder assist line. You come to the factory, you help us build the airplane. You earn 51% of that build. You can do the, your maintenance on that airplane yourself. And then we have uh, certified airplanes as well, the X Cub. Uh, we still build the top cub uh, for working in the backcountry. So we've got several models. Uh, it just depends on what you need, how we're going to use it. So what's the difference in the certified, non-certified? What's that do for us as a buyer? Uh, the non-certified airplanes allows you to do more things that you want to do to the airplane. You know, if you want to hang uh, cargo pods on it, add more lights, uh, add things that are going to help you use the airplane without necessarily the oversight, you can do that. Uh, as long as you think it's safe and capable, you can do that to the airplane. The FAA has certain parameters they need to follow and have us follow to make an airplane certified. So those are the primary differences. What's the, any weight differences legally or anything like that? Well, certainly every airplane has an empty weight and a maximum you know, uh, gross weight. So you have to stay within those parameters. Um, but de again, depending on how you're gonna use the airplane, what you're gonna carry, uh, we have an airplane that fits all of that. I had a quick question. You mentioned experimental and going to the factory to build. Yes. What's that time commitment that if you're looking to go the experimental route, if you want to buy a carbon cub, what does that look like? Yeah, so three different ways to get an experimental airplane with us. You can buy a light sport carbon cub and you may want big tires, extended fuel, cargo pods, those types of things. Very quickly you run out of useful load. So what we do at the factory is we convert that airplane to experimental light sport. Now we add those features that you want to use, it becomes an experimental airplane. Uh, we do that to about 96% of our Carbon Cub SS line that we build. The second way is through our kit program. We have two kits that we offer, the EX2 and the FX2. Those are based off of our Builder Assist program, the FX2 and the FX3, which you have. So we can ship you a kit, one of those two airplanes. You can build it yourself at your home, shop, whatever. And then the third way is our Builder Assist program, the FX program. You come to our factory on a minimum of two visits. The first week you're there, uh, it's for five days. Uh, you're with our team on the floor building parts. You're stamping ribs. 
uh, you're in our composites lab building carbon fiber parts, all those types of things. Be in our metal fab shop, cub cutting tubing. We batch those parts, do a QA inspection on them. You go home for 16 weeks and we build your airplane the way you expect it. Then we take it apart, take the cowling off, the prop off, some of the tail feathers, those sorts of things. And then you come back for a two day visit, do the final assembly with our group. And then the DAR comes in, has an interview with you, asks you questions and the airplane gets certified. Wow. It's really that easy. Uh, the last step in that is a 40 hour fly off. The FAA calls it phase one. You can choose to do it yourself in the beautiful area of Yakima Valley, or uh, you know we can do it for you. Okay. So that's the process. It's awesome to see the differences, in, like depending on how involved you want to be in it. If you want to Absolutely. be building in the garage, which would be a little too much for me, but being able to go to the factory, have the experts and the right tools, right place to go through the process just sounds incredible. And then, because I want to know about the plane. Sure. And then you really get to know about the plane when you're going there and having the experts walk you through, turning wrenches, driving rivets and things like that. So yeah. it's cool to see this And as an owner, that makes a huge difference, just knowing what's underneath the skin and where things are and stuff like that it gives you this different level of comfort that i'm not just getting in a plane i have no idea what this thing looks like underneath the skin so it's it's a big difference for an owner yeah when you're in the factory like that like i said you're making those parts but you're walking around our group and you're watching them put in the fuel system so when you're at home you know where the fuel system is in that airplane you know That's what I mean? Huge. So it yeah. makes thing, makes a big difference. It, it's up there just so you know. Yeah, so I know, but but no one but knowing those things, again, as a pilot, how your plane works when something is not going right or maybe just sound a little funny because you want to be tuned in, especially with some of the stuff this thing can do. Yeah. Well, in the fifty one percent, right, you get to take that repairman's course and then you can do your own maintenance. And you might not be an engine guy, but knowing how it all goes together, you can do those sorts of things and then just hire an AMP to do the engine work. So it makes things a lot easier. It makes those inspections less expensive also. Yeah, so. absolutely. So what are the specs on, we've got, we're gonna go through with John, you're gonna take him through the FX3, and then we're gonna go over to the NX. Okay. What are the specs on this versus that, and then we'll do the walk around. Sure, so the FX3, uh, that's part of our builder assist program. That airplane is a 2,000 pound gross weight airplane. Most of the airplanes weigh roughly about 1140 to 1200 pounds, depending on options. Fuel injected 363i light combing engine. We offer actually three different propellers on the airplane, an 80 inch two blade constant speed, an 83 inch constant speed uh, two blade, and then the three blade uh, 80 inch constant speed prop. It has an improved heating system over our uh, Carbon Cub SS that started production back in uh, 2010. Well, those are the primary differences of that airplane. Uh, several different panels that we can offer you, a full glass G3X uh, suite, where we can go and put like a 760 panel in the airplane, autopilot, G5, we can make the uh, panel IFR capable if you like. There's just so many things and it's customizable. So. Yeah. And what are the performance specs on it? So in cruise, this airplane roughly runs about 130 miles an hour true airspeed on 29 inch bush wheels. Takeoff performance, uh, about four lengths of the fuselage realistically with half tanks, you know, and <laughs> Uh, it's most, a blast, let me tell you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> when, awesome. when I'm alone, it's about the length of the airplane. It's just that's it's awesome. crazy. Yeah, most of us at the factory can land them well under 200 feet, you know, with a reasonable approach, down, stop. So uh, it performs very well. All yeah. right, so we're going to have you walk this plane with John, put him in the cockpit, sure. and let's go through the inside. Okay. Well, John, this is the FX3 here. Uh, a very aggressive cowling, wide opens here, uh, takes in a lot of air, it's hungry for air. This airplane will climb from zero to 14,000 without overheating wow. at about 1,700 feet a that's, minute. That's incredible. I do know that you mentioned the props, two-bladed, three-bladed. Obviously, walk around, there's some differences. Can you kind of talk me through what the difference is in performance and what that changes from prop to prop. Sure, absolutely. So the three blade, obviously a three blade's uh, usually quieter. Uh, that's one of the first things. A lot of times it's a little smoother. Uh, that is harmonic through the airframe and it's sexy, right? A it three blade prop is sexy. It does look really good. So it's, uh, it improves the climb a little bit, but the two blade is probably the most aggressive propeller that we'd put on the airplane. If you're looking for speed, performance, climb, all those things, I'd get the 83 inch two blade. Okay. If I'm looking for a sexy seaplane, I'd probably put the three blade on it. The 80 inch prop, uh, to be quite honest, we don't sell a lot of them. If somebody's gonna travel cross country with the airplane, they might put a smaller wheel and tire package on the airplane, it improves speed. They don't need the big prop, so they might do it that way as well. As a rule, the 83 inch is probably the number one seller and then the three blade 80 inch after that. If we don't change anything else other than the prop, 
Are we looking at a big difference in climb performance, takeoff, landing performance, fuel consumption, or is it really no, relatively not, minor? You gotta yeah. be doing some other changes too if you're really trying yeah, to Yeah, absolutely. Save. So uh, if you needed to descend rather quickly, this would probably help you descend. There's more paddle out there, yep. help you descend more quickly without overspeeding. So, um, but it's, it's a tremendous looking propeller. Hartzell's been a, a partner of ours for a long time and they do a great job. It does look really sexy. I know there's a couple other features up here on the nose you wanted to point out. Can you kind of walk me through some of the different, you know, some of the things that are exciting about this? Yeah, uh, one of the most exciting things about Cub Crafters is we make most of our own stuff. So this uh, composite spinner, we make that in house. The cowling, that's all composite made. The gills here for, for good cooling, those are all composite. Um, like I mentioned, the big air intakes, there's a big oil cooler, it sits right at the top there, that helps keep it cool. Well, can you show me how to get in this thing? Yeah, absolutely, piece of cake. So I put my left hand here, my right foot up on the tire, grab this bar with my right hand, get my hip on the door, lean back, swing my legs in, and slide ahead. It's really just that easy. 10 times doing it, Right. you're a pro. Let's see what happens on the first one. Yeah, absolutely, give it a run. All right, so let's go. Right hand. Right hand? Yep. See, left hand. Yep, hip on the door. Now lean back, stretch your arm out. Swing them both in, straddle the stick. You're in. All right, wasn't as graceful, you know, but I didn't First fall. First time, you I did real well. I didn't fall. You didn't fall out, didn't hit your head, that's good. Wow. Cool, right? So this is our G3X suite. It's also IFR capable. We have a Garmin GNC uh, 355 in here for the backup stuff. Uh, autopilot, 307 autopilot from Garmin. The G3X is right here. And then we have a G5 backup, AOA. That's huge. Yep. There's actually two of them. One in the G3X, one up on the panel, and then we have a heated pitot tube also. I don't know why every plane doesn't have AOA. Um, I don't know either. It's, it's one of those things. It's, it, the safety margin that adds is huge. Yeah, and it's 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 three-prong attack, right? So you got audio, you got you got right in front of your video, all those sorts of things. So we don't certify the airplane for IFR. Uh, honestly, we're afraid too many people might take a fabric covered airplane into some hard IFR stuff. So we don't do it. But as an EAB airplane, experimental airplane, anything's game. Okay. So for my purposes, you know, I live in the Northeast, early mornings in the fall, early mornings in the spring, there can be a deck level there that you want to get up and go. This works for that. To me, I quit. this is like the motorcycle of the skies. That's the way I always look at yeah. it. Door open, beautiful day like today, go cruising. That's what that's what flying's yeah. all about. This this is our dirt bike in the sky. Yeah. This what, is, do, what do you think of that stick? So, you know, coming from the Viper, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. You know, like it's, I mean, just the ergonomics here, so nice. Yep. So we have electric trim right here. This hat switch is an autopilot runaway trim release, and then, uh, your trigger, pistol trigger right there, yeah. that's push to talk. Yeah, perfect. Our manifold pressure, throttle, and prop control are right there on the left together. Uh, you're sitting in Oregon Arrow's leather seating right here. We offer three different seating uh, combinations in this airplane uh, as far as uh, covering leather, cloth, and uh, ballistic nylon seating, depending on uh, what you want to accomplish there. The seat is adjustable fore and aft here. We also offer, um, in every airplane, this is called a sling seat. So the sling seat can be taken out. It folds up, it okay. goes up here in the cargo net, and it really offers you a great deal more cargo space here. Another option that we offer for those people that uh, need a little more stability in the back seat, we have a fixed mounted rear seat. It's also adjustable fore and aft. So my wife, for instance, gets a little claustrophobic back there. I'll put her in the fixed seat. Give her a little bit more. Yep. And actually, I want to jump back here. Sure. You can change how this looks up here, the front panel Absolutely. and what you want. Can you talk to me some, about, maybe some of the options you can do up here and how that might look different from plane to plane? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, we get this loaded up here and immediately you have all the information that you think you might need. Now you can reconfigure this. If you want to split the screen, put the map on half, you know, uh, put your attitude indicator on the other half, you can do that. You can tap the map here, draw it over to the right side. You want your engine management to be bigger, you can put that there. So I might put it on that engine management page for the startup, you know, maybe even the takeoff because it's right there in my face. I'm watching all the vitals. I can do that as well. I can get out of that or go back in it. I can have a fuel calculator totalizer right there. So I always know how much fuel I have on board. Um, all those sorts of things. If you're going to run it on autopilot using the 307 here, 
uh, what you might do is center the bug just like that and now you can go into nav mode with the autopilot take you right to your destination but how many times when you're flying into busy airspace might a controller say turn left 20 degrees so now you can go into heading mode also turn the dial away the airplane goes you know, have an autopilot in this, you know, for majority of the use, you're probably not doing it, but it's those busy times when you can have someone help you out. And that's being able to focus on busy airspace, talking to controllers, et cetera. And again, I'm a huge safety proponent, so having another, you know, helping hand and embracing the technology that we have today available, I think is great. Yep. What do you think of our flap handle up there? That's so slightly different, again, from where I'm coming from. Yeah. Auto flaps, but it's just kind of nice to have it right here. Everything's... Yep. It's right there. It's not down on the floor like the uh, traditional Super Cub might have had. So you've got a little more leg space there. This cockpit really is four and a half inches wider than what a traditional Super Cub was. The panel is about five inches forward of what a Super Cub was. So for big guys like you, look at the knee clearance you have here on the panel. I, like, I don't feel claustrophobic. I feel like I got plenty of room. It's very comfortable, which yep. again, is something you wouldn't necessarily expect just glancing at it without knowing anything about. You know, when customers come in and they're looking and they're comparing airplanes, one of the first things I do is have them get in it. Because if they can get in it easy, there's a lot more space, they go comparing, it's, right. it's the first thing. So John, this is the same panel we have in the E3 plane, but I gotta tell you, one of my favorite buttons, is this IBDS, you know, that's, uh, and it's called the Instrument Backup Battery System. So the nice thing about it is, you know, first thing I do is when I'm doing my walk around or I'm getting ready to pull the plane out, it's still in the hangar, I just come flip the switch and it, it starts up. You don't need your master on, you don't need to be anybody else on, and it brings up your panel. Yeah, yeah, and you're not building airframe time that way either. Yeah. It just flips on, you've got all your vitals there, and yeah. absolutely. So then that's booting up as I'm pulling out, doing my pre-flight and stuff, and then the nice thing is, is then when you come on with your master and you, you, you start up, then it charges that separate battery. So that battery's standalone, it's by itself, and it's also like a backup. So yeah, that's you huge. Your, you still got your panel here, but I like it more for convenience, because I'm a, I'm a weekend warrior. So <laughs> my point is, is, you know, when I shut down to get fuel or something, I don't turn that off. You just keep that on, and, and then you don't have to reboot. When you get that's out, right. you get some fuel on. Even if I run in the restaurant, get some breakfast or something, I just let the thing sit there for a half hour, 45 minutes. And when you come back on, the main battery will charge that IDBS back up so while, while you're running. And, and it's, so it's, it's an awesome switch. I love it. It's probably one of my, I wish we had it in the Conquest. It's also worth noting that uh, all of our airplanes have electronic ignition, either from light speed or from light combing. So this one has light speed ignition, uh, fully electronic ignition with a backup battery that sits over here in this panel. So if you're to lose ship's power, uh, you just flip on the emergency switch, which is right over there. There's okay. an emergency switch, and this battery gives you 30 minutes to allow yourself someplace to land. That's huge. This is a great setup. I'd like to kind of hop out and actually do a little talking about the sure. landing gear and how this plane is used and some yep. of the things you can do with it because it's different than most. Yep, cool. Let's jump out. So I come from the land of 10,000 foot runways. This can do some pretty incredible stuff and you can do things that other planes can't. Can you kind of walk me through some of the things that customers might be using the Carbon Cub for and then talk me through the landing gear because this is pretty beefy and allows you to do some of those cool things. Yeah, sure. So a lot of our customers, one of the biggest dreams they ever have is flying from their home in their backyard or their camp or their lake or things like that. I fly out of a 900 foot strip on a, on a lake up in upstate New York. so. Uh, I can be down and stopped in 300 feet at my camp, park that airplane, jump in my J3 on floats, head for the water, just like that. And this landing gear helps you do those types of things. Um, this particular airplane, the FX3, has extended heavy duty 3x3 landing gear on it. So the gear is literally, the axles are three inches down closer to the ground, raises the airplane and the prop clearance, and it's also three inches forward. Okay. What does the three inches forward do for you? it adds 20 pounds of weight to the tail without putting the weight back there. You know, if you need to get down and stop quickly, you can get a little more aggressive with the brakes without having a nose over. And that's what that's all about. For years, we've had different types of landing gear. There's three inch extended, there's three by three, there's six inch extended now. Okay. So lots of things you can do there to increase clearance and uh, a margin of safety. This particular airplane has Acme's uh, Pro, uh, Pro shocks on it. They have a tremendous dampening effect, so they can take the sins out of landings, particularly for pilots that are new to, you know, backcountry or tailwheel yeah. flying. So they might land a little hard, 
but with the Acme shocks, it softens. The cable, you kind of highlighted a little earlier before we were uh, recording here. Can you talk to me what the cable is and if that's a requirement? Well, uh, certainly if you're going to be in heavy backcountry, and I'll go to Alaska for that, uh, Alaska uh, rocks, stumps, things like that, the concern is the gear splaying out. You know, if you have a hard landing, run into materials, things like that, the gear wants to go this way. And if it happens without these safety cables, now you have a prop strike. If you have a prop strike, you're stuck right where you are. So the cables help keep the gear at least in close enough so that you don't have a prop strike. Uh, are they required? No. They can add a little bit of weight. I don't have them, honestly, on my airplane. I live in upstate New York, and I don't land on anything super hard like that. Yeah, not landing on the side of a mountain at like 45 degrees. Or That's anything. right. It, it but I, I do have the Acmes. Yeah. Do you have those? Again, I'm a 10,000 foot runway guy. How fast can you stop this plane, and what, what do you need for a runway length? There's all different skill levels, right? There's all different types of training. Um, but take, for instance, somebody that's new to tailwheel. Very quickly, they'll be landing in, in 500 feet, down and stopped. You know, we, we give them that margin of error. They might start with a 12 or 1500 foot runway and just slowly improve their skills. Just about anybody can get to 500 feet. Our guys here, well under 200 feet landings. That's awesome. But they've been doing it for years. Right. They do it every day. And if you come out to our camp, you'll see a little bit about what that's awesome. about. As far as takeoff goes, again, it depends on the empty weight of the airplane and what you're gonna put in it. With me, uh, half tanks of fuel, just myself, no stuff in there, uh, generally be off in between three and four lengths of the fuselage. Incredible. It's pretty quick. Yeah, that's all right. So, anyway, <laughs> yep. This landing gear is open landing gear. Uh, we talked about that just briefly earlier. The open landing gear is, is uh, a little more rustic backcountry. It's not covered in fabric like our wings are, so you don't run the risk of damaging it. All of our you know, backcountry people, uh, that's what they're looking at is the open landing gear. But you could do different things, correct? Certainly, okay. yep, yep, absolutely. So John, all of our airframes are made of 4130 chromoly steel tubing. Uh, that's welded in a jig in our factory. Uh, then it's sent for powder coating uh, to help inhibit rust. The wings themselves are all aluminum core structure, aluminum ribs that are stamped in our factory, um, extruded uh, spars. The wing struts are aluminum. Um, and then the whole airframe is covered in polyfiber fabric. It's a material that's uh, actually glued on the airframe and then in two different temperature settings, it shrunk. That's what gives it its drum okay. effect. Yeah. Uh, then we put the materials on it, the coatings on it, uh, poly brush and poly spray. The poly brush protects the fabric from oil, dirt, contaminants, things like that. The poly spray, the silver material, protects it from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Um, from there, most customers choose uh, our most popular urethane paints based on our paint schemes. Okay. Uh, but you can do a, a variety of things there. Well, some, some people choose the, the flatter tones of paint from, uh, from Polybrush. But uh, as a rule, our, our airplanes get covered in urethane. So it nice. gives it a shiny look. Yeah, that's great. Um, the flaps and ailerons are also aluminum. Uh, we build those in the, in the shop as well. This particular airplane, as well as the X-Cub, have G-Series flaps and ailerons. That's important compared to our Carbon Cub SS because it, it makes the stick feel uh, in roll lighter. And so there's an added shape here okay. uh, on the aileron and the flap, and there's also a wider block edge here on the back. And people ask, well, what, what's that do? Well, the air is coming over the top and the bottom, and it takes a little bit longer because of the radius here. It takes a little bit longer for that air to catch up to each other back here, so it makes the stick lighter and roll. Roughly about 25, maybe 30% lighter. And such as, I mean, it's just, I mean, a relatively small minor detail that makes a big difference like that. Yeah, our engineers come up with that stuff. Science. Always Math. developing, always innovating. Yeah. That's what we do. The top of the wing is fabric as well. Um, most of our airplanes have a cargo compartment right here. That's a carbon fiber door there with a carbon fiber frame. Feel okay. how light that is. There's nothing to it. Yeah, wow. And everything we do is, is about weight, saving weight improving performance. We joked, uh, yeah. what's the worst thing you can put on an airplane? Yeah, weight, for yeah. sure. This particular airframe has a reverse dog leg in there that you can see, that opens up the space forward and aft. Yeah. You know, and if you were in a backcountry situation with harsh weather, you could sleep in there if you needed to. Pull that seat up, climb in there. Wouldn't be the most comfortable thing, right. but you'd be dry. It's better than being outside, right? That's right, yep. So as you move to the back of the airplane, you know, standard elevator uh, system back here, 
rudder. Uh, this particular airplane has the baby bush wheel on the back, gives it that big backcountry look. This is what we would use in the backcountry. Down here in the loader, lower 48, 48 states, we'd have the standard 3200A tail wheel. People okay. that are operating off of asphalt more times than not, uh, I would recommend the 3200A, the baby bush wheels for the backcountry people. Okay, doing some doing yep. some real bush flying. Yep. You may have noticed the skylight up there. Uh, that helps improve visibility, particularly in steep turns. You yeah. know what those are about. Yeah, it's nice to look out top, you know? Yep. Not just yep. straight ahead. For sure. Uh, this, this airplane also has 44 gallons of fuel on board. Uh, we have the option of adding a fuel pod to the belly, a belly pod. And those belly pods can be a mix of fuel and cargo, just cargo or just fuel. Just depends on your needs. So the standard fighter pilot answer is it depends. And I'm going to ask you one of those probably it depends type questions. But range fuel burn, what are we kind of on average looking at? In an FX3 normal cruise, about 10 gallons an hour. That's three hours, three hours and 15 minutes. Okay. You're ready to get out at that point right. anyway. <laughs> right. yep. I'm a 1.3 type guy. Okay, good. Mark, so this is a little bit different than we were just looking at that FX3 over there. I noticed there's a nose wheel here. Can you kind of walk me through some of the differences, what the possibilities are here? It's still a Cub, John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a nose wheel, but you can't see that from inside. It flies absolutely like anything else we build. Okay. But there's a whole lot more people that can fly this, okay. right? If, if a person is concerned about, you know, staying current and proficient and flying a tail wheel is not like riding a bike, um, they have to be proficient, regular flying, things like that. But if they don't have time for that, no inclination for that, this is the way to go. This airplane is equally capable in the backcountry, uh, but more people can fly it. So it's marketing genius as far as we're concerned, because if yeah. you look at uh, Piper's lineage, they built roughly 600 uh, pacers, the tail wheel version, but Piper built over 9,500 tri-pacers with a nose wheel. And you can change this out. It can be tail wheel configured, correct? That's the awesome thing about it. This airplane was developed over a course of six years with our own money, top secret. Um, the X-Cub was, we launched it in 2016. The whole goal all, all along was to get it under a nose wheel as well. Um, we have a, uh, a transformation kit, if you want to call it that, a conversion kit, and we can change the tail wheel with two people in about four and a half hours. Wow, that's Raise incredible. it up, there's two hooks up there. We raise it up, drop the nose gear, put a different landing gear spring on it, put the tail wheel on, it's ready to go. That's awesome. Can We've we got a good video for that too. Yeah, that'd be great to check out. Can, you, can we jump in and take a look yeah. and see some of the differences? Yeah, same principle getting in, except you lost a tire here for your helper. Yeah. So to get in this one, um, same thing. I just use this step, get up on the door like this. Everything else is the same, John. Okay. And we get in. I'm gonna move this seat back. It's got an adjustable front seat, same leather from Oregon Arrow. The panel is going to look a little bit different to you, but many of the same pieces. And then it's a little bit of a reach down to the ground, but okay. it's easy enough to do. Right hand right up there. Let's see. Yep. Two. On the door, lean back, swing them both in and straddle. All right. Now you're a pro. That's the second time you Slowly did that. Slowly getting there. In looking at the panel, uh, this airplane looks very similar, except for a couple of little differences. We've got a vernier mixture control over there. The prop and throttle are the same. The G3X, virtually the same, but we move the autopilot down here. Okay. So it's a little closer to use. That opens up space here for what? A float controller. We're gonna float this airplane as well. We're gonna put it on whip line floats. That's where the float controller goes. And this airplane's faster. Um, it has a 215 horsepower, 393 engine from Lycoming. It has Lycoming's uh, ignition system in it. You can buy an X-Cub in four different configurations or certification modes. We build this as an EAB, either tail wheel or nose wheel. And we also build the airplane certified part 23, also in tail wheel or nose wheel. Okay. So four different ways to get this airplane. Yeah, very nice. And that's largely dependent on, you know, whether a customer wants to go through the builder assist program. Do they want to make this airplane IFR capable? We can do that under the EAB program. We can't do it under the Part 23 program. Okay. Yes. Yeah, again, a lot of options. That's as we right. Go through this. It's all customizable. Uh, we determine that before you start the build of the airplane. So, um, this airplane also has 50 gallons of fuel. Again, in the wings. Um, the seating is very similar. That seat removes. The baggage compartment's very similar. Um, but it's a little bit faster airplane. This airplane's about 150 miles an hour in cruise. 
So it gets along pretty good. I, I think the biggest advantage to the whole thing is more people have the opportunity to get in the backcountry with this airplane. And any kind of, I mean, any big differences or limitations with doing backcountry flying with a nose wheel versus having a tail wheel? Any considerations? No, I don't think so. In fact, I think it's improved because this airplane, right, on the nose wheel is already up in flight attitude. So when you pour the coals to it, this thing's ready to fly right now. There's no pitching it, you know, back up and getting up in uh, ground effect and those types of things. This airplane comes up and goes. Um, as far as backcountry goes, our strut here has nine and a half inches of travel. So that's some pretty rugged terrain. Yeah. Um, so that's a big help as well. It's a beefy strut just looking at it. Very beefy. Yep, very beefy. And it swings 270 degrees. You use counter braking to get okay. it to turn. And if you get parked somewhere and you need to push it backwards, we have a release pin in the mechanism down here. You pull a pin, now it'll rotate 360 degrees or 180 degrees in this, in this case, and you can push the airplane backwards. Okay. So it's easy to use. Yeah. Very right easy to use. Hey, E3 members, I hope you enjoyed hanging out with Mark, me and Brian at Cub Crafters, walking around. It was great to go through and just see just some of the amazing things you guys are pumping out. So thanks for taking the time and doing yep, that. Glad to have yeah. you guys here and having there's us. A little, there's a little secret that we have to put out right now, right? What's today? We're in uh, yeah, we're Wednesday, 2022, 2022. Wednesday in July. And a special announcement, I think, just happened Monday? Yeah, on Monday, yep. Uh, we're going public. Big deal. That's um, huge. We're offering to our customers a Regulation A uh, offering uh, for stock in our company. That's that's huge for us. By the way, us, us owners get first dips at these. We're going. You absolutely do. <laughs> and that and that's what Cup Crafters is all about, keeping our community right in tight with us. Help awesome. us grow. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Mark, appreciate it. Thanks for everything. Thanks a lot, fellas. We're going we're to come, yes. come up and see the factory, and we'll do some more content for all our members out there and, and yeah. uh, see more of the behind the scenes and stuff. So. Cool. Awesome. Thanks Have a everybody. great show. Take awesome. care, members.